Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. I'm starting a new project today. I'm going to repair this Heathkit IP20 power supply. Let's get to it. I picked up this non-working Heathkit IP20 power supply at this year's Hamvention for 10 bucks. It's a non-functional parts unit that definitely needs some TLC. You can check out my episode about all my Hamvention purchases for more details about its condition. And before I can move forward with any repairs or mods, I've got to make sure that the meter and the transformer are both still good. Checking out an analog meter is actually pretty easy. Um, there is one key parameter that you need to know and that is how many milliamps or microamps does it take to cause the needle to go to full deflection. Now Heathkit, or probably more precisely Heathkit suppliers, have made it really easy over the years. They've put the parameters right on the front face of most of their meters. And this one, I don't know if it's coming through on camera or not, says 1 milliamp and 50 ohms. So that means at 1 milliamp I would expect the needle to be at full scale. And 50 ohms is the nominal resistance of the meter. So I can simulate the circuit working by just feeding current directly through the meter. So to do that, another thing I like to do is just clip the wires on whatever gear I'm working on. I don't like loosening these nuts uh, unless I absolutely have to because you always risk the chance that you're going to start spinning the mechanism inside the meter. And these are solder tabs, so it's easy enough to solder back to it later. So clip those wires off and then I'll just use test leads to connect it to, kind of hit in the background, my 2718 power supply, but I've got a 4.7k ohm resistor in series between the power supply and the meter. And then I've also got my DMM uh, in series as well, so I can monitor and use this as a referee for just how many milliamps is actually flowing through the circuit. The 4.7K comes from just simple math. Uh, I picked five volts arbitrarily as equal to uh, one milliamp. Ohm's law tells you that's 5K series resistance I need and 4.7 is close enough. So let me hook this up. And of course there's polarity uh, to the meter since it's a di uh, digital, <laughs> it's a DC meter, not AC. So make sure I've got the polarity correct. And let's make sure this is back in focus again. Yep, it seems to be. And we'll just demonstrate the meter working. Another, another thing I'm looking for here is how smoothly the needle is responding. Is it sticking or binding? And it doesn't seem to be, so that's good. Now what I've done here before I press record on the camera, I did this test under a little more controlled conditions, meaning I set the voltage until I got the needle as close as I could get it to the 10 and then recorded what the DMM was saying and then do the 20, the 30, the 40, the 50, and then repeat going back down. And I'm gonna show those results on screen right now. And ideally, we'd expect, of course, a straight line there. And it's not quite straight. There's a little bit of wonkiness near the low end and that just might be the normal behavior of this meter. It's not that bad. Um, it might actually get better with a little exercise on the meter, but certainly it's good enough for me to keep moving forward with using this meter in this project. Next up, I need to make sure that the transformer is okay. And good news, it is fine. Uh, let me just show you briefly what I did to check it out because it took a little while to go through this step by step because I had to check each of the secondary windings. First thing I did was check it on the dim bulb tester and no issues there. But I also want to make sure that there isn't a large voltage drop when it's actually under load. So to do that, I need to come up with an appropriate load. And I happen to have a bunch of these 25 ohm power resistors and taking three of them in series and then putting uh, two pairs of those three in parallel gives me 37 and a half ohms, which is just about where I want to be if I want to test about 55 volts to get close to 1.4, 1.5 amps. So the setup here is pretty simple. Uh, the Keithley up top is set as an ammeter, and my basic DMM right here is just set to measure uh, AC RMS. And I've got the front panel switch down here set to the, its highest setting, 50 volts DC. Uh, I have cut and isolated, I should mention that, uh, the transformer from the rest of the circuit. So I cut it right where it would up to the diodes since the diodes at, at 
no matter what, I'd have to replace. I see that they're uh, cracked and a couple of them have broken leads. So no matter what, those diodes are going to, have to be replaced. So just the transformer by itself, measuring the AC at the secondary and then hooking up this load to it. Looking at the heat kit specs um, with the output set to 50 volts, I'd expect to see 53 volts RMS coming out of the transformer, no load. And I got 57 and, and a half, roughly. And part of that difference is I've got this connected directly to my AC mains here, and it's 125 volts. The heat kit specs were 117 volts, so there's a several percent difference there just by the, um, the delta in the mains voltage. Now, what I'm looking for here is to not see a significant voltage drop. So what is significant? Probably more than 10% would be alarming. Start to make me concerned that the secondary windings on the transformer might be suspect. So I'm at 57.49, 57.5 right now. Let's see what it's like under 1.4 amps load. This item contains hazardous voltage and safety precautions must be followed. If you're following along and working on your own version, you're doing so at your own risk. So 1.4 uh, and a fraction more, 54.8, 54.9. That's definitely fine. That's going to work okay. So at this point, like I say, I've got a good meter and I've got a good transformer so I can move forward. All right, so now that I know that the meter and the transformer are both still working okay, I can move forward with getting this power supply working again. And as usual, there's two ways to go about a project like this. The first is to attempt to restore it to original configuration. So let's talk about benefits and downsides of going that way. The benefits actually are pretty limited. The performance specs on this power supply are decent, but nothing spectacular. There's also minimal nostalgic value. It is just a power supply after all. It's not like my HW101 transceiver that I restored a while back. It's just not particularly a collectible item and there's no emotional attachment to it. The downsides, however, are pretty extensive. Parts are gonna be expensive and hard to find. The transistors in particular, well, they're not silicon, they're germanium, they're that old. The 2N1548, 2N2147, for example, those went out of series production decades ago. There's no modern equivalent, so you'd be scrounging up new old stock or salvaged parts. And you cannot substitute modern silicon transistors in that uh, circuit without changes. So, and that's best case scenario. You might not be able to make the circuit work with uh, silicon transistors. There's also 10 capacitors, starting with these two guys right here, that would have to be replaced. Big guys are generally big price. You can sometimes find a way to restuff these and keep the outside shell so you maintain the overall appearance. But again, more dollars, more time, especially uh, with trying to restuff an old cap. And there's lots of little things. The handle is missing on this. I'd have to scrounge one up. Probably would need to buy another couple uh, of part, uh, a couple of a power supplies as parts units to get some of the other little parts that are missing. And the last thing that's kind of really the, the, the clincher here is the circuit. It's basically fragile. It's a known issue that those germanium transistors just won't tolerate hardly any switching transients. And it says right in the heat kit manual to not switch the ranges, switch between ranges fast because you'll risk damaging those transistors. So in the end, I could spend a lot of money and time and end up with something that just doesn't justify that effort. So... Approach number two, uh, keep only the best bits and pieces and build a practical design around them that achieves the same or maybe even better performance as the original. So starting, of course, with the meter and the transformer. Um, practical, of course, means that usual balance of the project trifecta, cost, time, and scope. So in the end, that's what I'm going to do, and that's how I'm going to approach this project. Now, because this is a moderately complex project, rather than jump right in and lay out all the circuit details, I decided to put a block diagram together first. And here's what that looks like. And like any block diagram, it doesn't show every detail, just the major elements. And you can see here the transformer, the meter, and a few of the rotary switches that I'm carrying over. I used Dave Jones's micro supply battery powered bench power supply as inspiration here that shares a common approach. So go check it out on EEV blog. Dave did a very nice job a few years ago. It's a multi-episode series on how to design a bench power supply. Now on my version here, let's look at the 
primary power flow from left to right, starting with a new bridge rectifier and bulk filter capacitors where the AC is being changed to DC. Then the DC current flows through a current sense amplifier, and then it splits. Some of the current will go through the voltage regulator. The rest will go through some bypass transistors to share some of that heat load. There's an op amp to monitor the signal from the current sense amplifier, and if that signal exceeds a limit set by the user, the op amp will then pull down the regulator's voltage setting, which causes the current to drop. And that's exactly how Dave's micro supply works. There's a fixed current load to keep a minimum load on the regulator so it stays in regulation. I'm showing the stock meter here. Um, it will be switchable, of course, between showing voltage or showing current. Uh, upper left is an 8 volt DC power supply. I'll use that to power the current sense amplifier, the op amp, and the user selectable current limit. And three of the elements here, uh, I mentioned heat earlier, so three of the elements here will dissipate significant heat that they will require being placed on heat sinks. And of course, that's typical with any linear power supply. It's just not efficient. As far as construction goes, I plan to build this on three separate circuit boards. The first one will contain the bridge rectifier and the bulk filter caps. Uh, number three will be the constant current load. And then number two will be everything else. Uh, it just makes sense to group them this way and split them up because one single board would be harder to fab. Separate boards enable a lot more flexibility for positioning them on the chassis. I'm in the middle of the detailed design work right now, and it is proving to be really challenging. There's so many interactions between those elements on the block diagram that I can't just start at the left end of the diagram and design it all the way through to the right. I'm constantly having to go back and tweak and adjust some of the values of the components. And in some cases, I've had to change components entirely when I found a problem in a simulation or some calculations that just didn't work right. So it's taking some time to go through that. And that will be the subject of the next episode, which is definitely going to be very technical. So I hope you guys stick with me as I go through this project and try to get this IP20 back to working again. So until next time, bye for now.